Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're on to 20 through 11 of my top 100 board games of all time. So if you made it this far, you've watched them all. Thanks very much. Um, I've enjoyed doing it. One more video to go. Uh, and I, I know I said at the beginning of the last video, I was like, oh, oh, most of the games are down here in the dining room. I don't have to go upstairs. I was like, oh, a lot of these games in these top 10, I did have to go upstairs to get. The reason being is there's some games in here that are a little more complicated that I don't get to play as often because while I love like a good three to five hour game, um, actually none of these are five hours, but like I love a good like, you know, two hour, three hour game. Um, a lot of people I play with are not as much fans of that. Uh, so uh, one thing I've learned in years of being in the hobby is especially if like me, you like to play all sorts of games play the games that the people you're playing with are going to like. Like, don't try and force them into something. Anyway, that's a whole other rant I could go on, but uh, let's get into 20 through 11. Number 20 is the first, is the only game in this 10 that I don't own, and this is the game Bonanza, B-O-H-N-A-N-Z-A, -A, um, which is like Bonanza, but with beans in German. Um, <laughs> It's also known as the Bean Game to some people, like Ed Minette, who's probably not watching this, but shout out to him. Um, Bonanza is by, it's a game designed by Uwe Rosenberg, who is my favorite designer. You will see him again in this top 10 and again in the next top 10. Um, he, the last one of his on the list actually was number 96, Patchwork. Um, but in Bonanza, you, it's a hand management game. You have these cards, you're trying, they're bean cards. You're trying to collect cards and collect various sets, and you have two little bean fields. You can buy a third one. And it's actually very simple, um, and uh, it takes probably a little under an hour. Um, so not not really a filler, but one of the simpler games in the top 20 here. Um, the weird thing about this game is that you cannot rearrange the order of your cards in your hand. So you have to keep them in the order that you draw them. Like when you draw them, you have to add them to the left, and then you play them from the right. And so they're cycling through, but you can get rid of cards in the middle by trading them to people in order to, in order to be able to play the cards you want to play, which is fascinating. It's it's great. Uh, um, it's a very much a trading game because you're trying to like be like, oh, I really want that chili bean. I'll, I'll give you this green bean for it. And I'm like, now nah, what if you also throw in a pinto bean? And the bean cards have ridiculous illustrations on them. Great game. Uh, highly recommend it for three or four people. I. I don't know that I'd play with two. Um, I'm sure there's rules to play with two, but three or four, great game. Number 19 is Age of Empires 3. Uh, this is a large game. This is from, originally from Eagle Games, I believe, and then Tropical Games. I don't know, Eagle Games had some interesting things going on with it back in the day. Um, Age of Empires 3 is, I guess, themed on the video game, on the computer game, but it's not really like there's not much in common with that other than age of discovery being the theme um this is a worker placement game you're placing workers down and then you move them over to the, to the new world and there's all this uh area control over there um i've managed to get some people like my wife to enjoy this despite some problem problematic theming um because it is very much colonization the game um so, but it's such a good good game that like it's worth it there's an expansion that was out that's out of print, I believe, called the Builder Expansion. It adds in another specialist. I'd love to get it, but I still haven't because it's really pricey. Um, yeah, but one thing about this game is that, so you have your regular guys, your colonists here, and then you also have specialists who do various different things, like the captain is good for discovery, but also for shipping. And so you can upgrade your colonists into various different roles and give them training and then the next turn they're more powerful that's pretty fun pretty cool uh like it i'm a big fan of worker placement that's one of my top worker placement games though def definitely not the highest um there's at least two more coming up um actually at least one more in this list and at least two more coming up in the next list i like i like worker placement number 18 splendor Splendor, and this may surprise people this this high up on the list. I love this game. This is a gateway game, meaning that like it's a good one I would use to introduce people to the hobby. Not my highest gateway game, but certainly still works really well. 
And in this game, like the theme is like your jewel merchants or something. Really what you're doing is you're getting these cards that give you these gems. And you have to buy the cards with little gem tokens, which are nice poker chips. Components are great. This is an economy building game re reduced to not its simplest. I'm sure there's simpler ones. But it's simplest while still being really fun. Um, it gives people that satisfaction of your actions make your later actions better because you've been investing in your layout. Um, and that's just a really good feeling. In addition, like, you know, the poker chips feel nice. And, like, strategy is sometimes obvious, sometimes not. But, like, such... Enough so that newer people can grasp what they're supposed to do and get that feeling of accomplishment of building up your cards. And then eventually like, oh, I get to take this card for free. It feels great, which is one of the reasons why it's a good gateway game, because it has those feel good moments to it. Um, that's number 18, Splendor. Number 17 is a game called Nexus Ops. Um, originally from Avalon Hill, um, this was after they got bought by Wizards of the Coast, but you probably don't care about um, the politics of who owns what, uh, what game companies. Um, though that was like significant at, at the time. Um, in this game, this you're playing like as you're on an alien planet and you're just fighting. This is a pure combat multiplayer game. You're fighting everybody else. You're rolling dice. Um, and the pieces are these weird, weird uh, glow-in-the-dark, well, not glow in the, glow in the black light fluorescent pieces. And um, so look, here we got, a, we got a rubium dragon. Here's this guy. I think I did play this once under a black light um, in the BSF common room. I don't can't remember who was playing, but I think James Rowe provided the, the black light. I could be wrong. Um, maybe Brennan, maybe, maybe Dean, I don't know. Um... Yeah, this is the best pure combat multiplayer. Much better than Risk. If you love Risk, this blows it out of the water. Um, the combat system is kind of similar to Axis and Allies, but simplified, um, which is also a game that I used to really love, Axis and Allies. I haven't played it much. You know, I haven't played it in a long time. But Nexus Ops gives you that feeling of conquest and achieving something in an hour and a half. And... It's really fun. Like, you're chucking a lot of dice. Who doesn't love dice? Um, yeah, that's Nexus Ops, number 17. Number 16 is the second Uwe Rosenberg game on this top 10, and it's heavy. This is Agricola. This is one of the most complicated games I own. Also one of the most stressful games I own. I love it. Used to be... My number one game, I believe, for a while, until it got dethroned by something that you'll see later. Um, also designed by Avery Rosenberg. Um, and in this game, you are... This is the, the fun game of sub subsistence farming in the late Middle Ages. And who doesn't love that? Um, in this game, you're trying to build up your farm and get an engine either going of baking bread or of animals, like being able to, you know slaughter sheep for food, um, in order to feed your family. Feeding your family, which happens at the end of every every few rounds, is hard. It's so hard. And because of that, you're always like, oh, how can I survive in this game without resorting to begging? Begging is an actual mechanic, and you lose three points if you beg for each food that you're missing, and like, you don't want to do that real bad. Um, in, the, in this game, you have, this, so this is worker placement. This is one of the most famous worker placement games. This is one of the more complicated ones, but also, like, it's so good. It's The fact that it's so stressful means it's hard to get other people to enjoy it because I like a brain burner like this, and a lot of other people aren't necessarily huge fans. Um, but, yeah, this is it's definitely fallen for me from what it used to be at. Um, I don't have the piece that has the version of the game that has like the nice little sheep meeples and like the anna meeples and the carrots that actually look like carrots and things. Um, but yeah, this one, 
is worth checking out if you're into games. If you're not, stay away. <laughs> That's number 16. And Greekle. <clears throat> number 15 is the highest co-op on this list. Also one of two games designed by Antoine Bauza. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, the two games in this 10 designed by Antoine Bauza. I think the only two on the top 100. This is Hanabi. Tiny little game. Um, in this game, you are, so like I said, it's a co-op. You're trying as a group to play five different suits, which are colors, really. So like, you're trying to play them from one up to five. And you have to start at the one, you have to go up to the five, and you have to play them not just in order, but like, you know, you cannot play the three until the two's been played, and things like that. Which would be simple, except for the fact that you cannot look at your own hand. So this, I've said before that I like co-ops if there's some limiting mechanism that means that you cannot communicate fully or you can't know fully. And in this game, you can't. So this would be my hand. This is what it looks like from my perspective. And I'm holding these cards up for everybody else to see. And so I'm just looking at these. So if someone else wants to tell me something about my hand, they have to spend a clue. And then they could say either like, these three are green, or this one is a three, or these two are fours. So they can give me very limited clues. And because of that, it's it's very hard. It's very stressful, but in a very fun way. I know I, I've said like, that stressful is like good a couple times here. By stressful, I mean like you're like, oh my gosh, is, is this going to work? Like, uh, But it's over a game. It's over something unimportant. And that's... That's fun. That's like building tension. Um, maybe I don't like scary movies, but maybe that's maybe that's similar to people who like scary movies. What they what they like about them. I don't know. Um, yeah, my favorite co-op game by far. Have yet to get twenty five points. I've gotten twenty four points several times uh, with Kenny and Colleen, with Mark and Jonathan and Amy, with Herb as well, I believe gotten to 24 so many times I have not yet gotten to 25 and this game is on board game arena so if you want to play with it let me know that's 15 hanabi number 14 is the third highest deck builder on my list the best deck builder to play with two people this is star realms also has a fantastic app if you're if you want to play an app um Star Realms, so here's the base game. I also have Frontiers and several of the command decks that I haven't popped open yet because I'm waiting to play them with Bob next time we get to play this. Um, and uh, there's a couple more in there that I have opened. Um, Star Realms is combat in a deck builder. It's al almost like a, a deck builder that has a lot in common with, common with Magic the Gathering. Uh, but the symbology is a lot easier, and like I would say that, yeah, it's, it's definitely easier than Magic the Gathering. I was going to show you some cards, but not in that one. That's why. The cards I don't need to play. Um, so let's see here. So you have these four different kinds of cards. You've got like the blue guys who are all about healing, which is actually good in this game. The red guys who are all about uh, scrapping cards, trashing cards. The yellow guys who are all about discard and sometimes drawing. And then there's the green guys, which is the aliens, the blob. Um, the theming is kind of hokey. And the, ooh, here's a great card right there. The blob alpha. Very simple. Cost six. Just deals ten damage. And, and once you take your opponent down to zero health, you win the game. Um, or authority, I think it's called. And they start at 50, so the ten is real good. Um, yeah. Star Realms is it's a simple deck builder and it works so well um the app is really good too and they every week they have like a new challenge like oh this time your scouts and vipers are worth twice as much or something like that and so and then you can play with the command decks which gives you different starting decks than your opponents which is one of the things i love about deck building games when they allow you to do the different starting decks um yeah, great game for two people. That's number 14, Star Realms. Number 13 is a game called Navigator. This is what's called a rondelle game. 
and this is an economy game. Uh, some people are going to decry that I have this way too high because they say it's a solved game. It's not. I'll explain why. In a Rondell game like this one, um, this is I've only played two Rondell games, so this one's far superior to MTK, in my opinion. Um, you have this little, little like wind star down here with these different spots. And you have one little guy, and each turn you, you get to take one of the actions in front of you. You can move him one to three spots. So you have, the goal is to plan out your path around the rondel while achieving points on the game, which you do through economy, you do through exploration, getting colonies, getting uh, factories. And yeah, uh, there's also a, basically a market in this game that does like supply and demand redux. So if you produce a bunch of sugar, then the factories which would refine that sugar are now worth more money. The next time you choose to use factories and the factories send a Sending the little cubes up and down such to simulate kind of supply and demand. Um, pe some people say that this game is unbalanced because factories is a better strategy than colonies or exploration. Um, first of all, it's true. Factories are a better strategy. So it is unbalanced. That doesn't mean the game's unfun, though. It does mean that you should not play this game with four people. Don't do it. Because... Generally speaking in this game, you want to be doing something different than the player in front of you is doing. If the player in front of you is getting a lot of sugar colonies, you should get a lot of sugar factories to profit off of when they go to the market. Then you can go to the market and you can make out real big. Um, not, not with the other player. Don't make out with the other player. And, you know, unless, unless that's okay. Um, consent. Um, but <laughs> got sidetracked there. Um, so yeah, factories are a better strategy, but if you have three player game and everybody knows this, or a five player game, works well with five, and everybody knows this, then it balances itself. In a four player game, it doesn't balance itself because the two people sitting across from each other will go factories, the other two people will go colonies, and one of the two people who goes factories will win. Now, if you explain at the beginning of the game that factories are very powerful, then therefore actually even in a four-player game, people knowing that will like go for factories, even though the person in front of them went for factories. It still doesn't work as well. Three or five players, it's great. It's fantastic. Um, so, there, yeah, there's talk sometimes of broken games, and this is actually an example that some people use of as a broken game. Um, it's not. It balances itself as long as you have that information. And every time I'm teaching this to someone new, I let them know, factories are generally the strongest strategy. So... Be aware, but if you're playing with five people and three of those people are going for factories, is it still the strongest strategy? It depends. Um, well, that was number 13, Navigator. <clears throat> number 12, second game by Antoine Baza on the list, Seven Wonders. My favorite seven player game. If I'm playing with seven people, Seven Wonders it is. Also well, works well with four, five, and six. Um, I just have other games I'd prefer to play with 4, 5, and 6. Um, though, you can play a 6-player game of this or a 7-player game of this in 15 minutes if, if everybody knows what they're doing. And I, I, I think I've done it in 20 minutes, being like my record. Um, it's still a lot of fun. The reason being, it's a drafting game. So in this game, you have a hand of cards. You take one, you pass the rest, you play the card that you took. Because everybody's acting at the same time, it plays well with higher player counts. Um, and yeah, that, and that works really well. Uh, the theme is like you have an ancient wonder of the world you're trying to build and you're get, drawing these cards and building up your economy and getting points. It's kind of standard drafting game, but it works so well. Um, I have the cities expansion. I'm a big fan of that one. Haven't, I've played with the leaders expansion, but don't own it. Um, sometime, someday I'll pick it up. I'm interested in playing Armada. Not, haven't tried battle and not, not really interested in it. Um, this used to be my wife's favorite game. Uh, Amy still loves this game, but uh, it was overtaken by Root, which is lower down on my list. Um, yeah, this is number 12, Seven Wonders. I used to think that this worked as a gateway game. I don't think it does anymore, especially when Sushi Go exists. Um, but the symbology can be a little confusing for new players, where Sushi Go doesn't have as much of that. Number 12, Seven Wonders. The last game... For this list, and just missing out on the top 10, is Castles of Mad King Ludwig. 
So last list, I talked about Suburbia, which is actually the predecessor to this game. This game came out after that. Um, and this is kind of similar to Suburbia, but there's enough differences that I, I don't mind having both. In this game, you're drafting these tiles. and Actually, you're not drafting. I shouldn't say that. They're on the board, and the one player who is the master builder arranges the pricing for them, and then everybody else can buy them for the master builder, and the master builder you know, carries on to the next player. Um, actually fairly balanced. Um, and you're playing these, these rooms down, and these, these are all different tiles that you have that you're buying, and they give you different um, bonuses, different points. And then uh, if you complete it, a, a room, and complete means uh, filling in all of the doorways. So like this room here has a doorway there, 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 and there, and they're all completed. So you get the bonus, which for purple would be rescoring the, the room again, which is good. Um, in fact, this layout is like ridiculously good. This person has things so nice, like this room's complete, and it's complete, that's complete, that's going to be, eh, maybe not, but complete, complete, and like, yeah, like the doorways are lining up so well. But it's a bit of a puzzle, but like a competitive puzzle. And um, it's really hard to know how to price things so that other people don't uh, get things cheaper than they should. Uh, but I really like this game. Um, this is definitely a little more complicated. I wouldn't play this with people who are too new to the castle, to the, <laughs> to the castle, to the board, to board gaming. Um, but I think the the theming is fun, and there's like all these weird rooms as well. I don't know if there's any on the back here. Um, but like, you know, some make sense. Like here's the vestibule, but here's a nap room. There's the Venus grotto right there, which is like an underground place to have plays with a bunch of water in it. And that was a real room in one of the castles of Magin Ludwig. Um, the guy who built Neuschwanstein, is that how, is that how you say that? Anyway, that, that one castle that the Disney, the Disney castle is based on. Anyway, um, that's number 11, castles of Magin Ludwig. So, that's it. Uh, second to last video. Next one will be the last of the top 100. I'm sure I'll do another video sometime about like top 10 games I want to play or something like that. Um, if you have any ideas, let me know because I, I will do this again. Um, although I might take a little break after finishing this top 100. Hope you enjoyed and I'll see you around.